Test. 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 That one is. You could hear me, right? Or okay. Testing. Te test. Mic check. One, two. Testing. Testing. Mic check, one, two, three, check. Test, testing, one, two, three. Hello, hello. Hello, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. All right, <laughs> testing, one, two, three, testing. From the beginning. <laughs> Welcome to the April 18th, 2022 meeting of the Parks, Recreation and Community Services Commission. Meetings are broadcast live on Glendale TV, viewable on Spectrum Cable, Channel 6, and AT&T Uverse, Channel 99. Meetings are also streamed live in high definition on the city's webpage, glendaleca.gov forward slash live on youtube.com forward slash Mike Glendale and on Apple TV, Roku and Amazon Fire devices using the free app called ScreenWeave and choosing Glendale TV from the menu. For public comments and questions during the meeting, please call 818-937-8100. Public comments on a specific agenda item will be taken from that agenda item uh, when the uh, uh, agenda item is discussed. Roll call. Thank you. Commissioners Alcazar? Here. Alfayan? Here. Meek? Here. Commissioner Wolfson's absent. President Sardarbegin? Present. Next item. The report of the recording clerk. The agenda for April 18, 2022 regular meeting was posted on the bulletin board outside of City Hall on or before April 15, 2022. Item two, upcoming council agenda items. Thank you, uh, President Sardar Bregan, members of the commission. We have one item coming up next month. Uh, we'll be presenting the fiscal year 2022-2023 community service and parks budget as part of one of many budget study sessions that will be held on May 3rd. Um, I do like to highlight that one new item that we'll be uh, requesting funding for is to hire a consultant to uh, update the recreation element and the open space element for next fiscal year. So I did want to highlight that because that was a request that was um, asked of staff um, a few uh, meetings ago. So we will be going to council and asking for those funds for next fiscal year. Uh, that's it for the next month. Next item, commission and staff comments. So yes, I can go first. <laughs> um, I did uh, just want to uh, mention one thing. Uh, so Commissioner Meek and I attended uh, the in-person CDBG community outreach meeting uh, this past week. And I wanted to recognize the important work uh, being done by the Community Services and Parks Department um, that sometimes goes unacknowledged uh, because um, our attention usually oftentimes goes to the park side of things. Um, but the meeting, uh, which involved uh, understanding uh, where the city is allocating their community development block grants, emergency solutions grants, and home grants, um, which is a fairly flexible pot of federal funding um, that the city receives to support low-income youth, seniors, families uh, with affordable housing and services, 
Um, I just really wanted to thank the city and the CDBG committee for creating a very thoughtful strategy for how to best use those resources we have uh, to really support our most vulnerable residents with affordable housing options, youth education, and professional development opportunities, as well as homelessness services and a, a slew of other things. So thank you, and I, I hope we can continue to work together to advocate for more mental health services, as well as permanent supportive housing resources that our city needs. So uh, Commissioner Wolfson is not here today, so um, should I read? Or would you um, comment on her? No, President Sardarbegian, if anybody else has um, comments, you can ask the other commissioner since Wilson's not here, unless she asked you to share something. No. Okay. <laughs> uh, commissioner Meek. Uh, yeah, I have a couple of comments. Uh, I would like to uh, make sure that the commission stays updated on the Fremont Park progress at three Fremont Park and to see how it keeps moving along so it doesn't get stalled anywhere. Uh, and I would like to a little information about the development impact fees from years ago that was going to go to soccer fields. And I wanted to get a little information about that to see whatever happened with that. Thank you. Oh, my last thing is uh, I did go to that meeting with uh, Regina and again, our staff is doing a wonderful job. I am so lucky to live in Glendale. Thank you. Commissioner Kofayan? I have no comments, go ahead. Last, me. <laughs> so uh, I was fortunate enough to uh, be present at the uh, Filipino American Friendship Monument uh, reveal just a couple of weeks ago. And I'd like to thank um, everyone who participated in that along with the, the, our wonderful Filipino community of the city who uh, helped not only the entire planning uh, portion of that, but they did, you know, steps A through Z along with our staff to, to kind of acknowledge and uh, pay respect to all the uh, Filipino Americans that we've had in the community and to pave the road for uh, future, um, I guess, friendship between the community. So thank you very much uh, to the Filipino American uh, community of the city of Glendale, along with our staff who um, went, you know, I think, uh, they did everything possible to make that monument happen. Um, along with that, I'd also um, like to welcome our new incoming mayor. Um, I've gotten a chance to speak to him about some of his um, kind of focuses, and one of the major focuses he does have um, does uh, relate to parks and um, different recreational activities we have in the city. Um, so he's really looking to establish some kind of a relationship between the school playgrounds and some kind of a shared space idea that he has going. So I think um, we're, we're really looking forward to see what you know lies ahead for us in the next year of uh, Mayor uh, Kasachian's uh, mayorship uh, with the city. Lastly, another uh, kind of item to throw out there is within the next few weeks, we are going to uh, have monthly uh, hikes with the mayor to visit the various parks and um, hiking trails that we have within the city. So please, please look out for that. Um, I think it's gonna be very fun, exciting to get to kind of know our uh, parks and different hike, uh, hiking uh, trails that we have. Um, that's about it for now. Thank you. Um, President Sardar Reagan, members of the council, uh, members of the commission, my apologies. Councils are Tuesday nights, <laughs> members of the commission. Um, so in, um, Commissioner Meek, in regards to Fremont Park, uh, we have our third party construction management company reviewing the plans. They've submitted their uh, notes and um, their suggestions to our architect. Architects reviewing them. We hope to go to um, uh, out to bid uh, within the next few months for uh, construction uh, construction contract. In regards to the DIF funds, uh, March of 2016, there was about eight million, a little over eight million dollars allocated to build soccer fields. Uh, in Glendale, uh, one being Wilson Middle School and the other one being uh, Cerritos Elementary. Those are the tw two joint use projects that were approved. We are waiting on the life cycle assessment, um, the artificial turf, turf study that's being conducted now by our consultant. Uh, we're waiting for that report to come out. Uh, we will bring that report to both uh, the commission 
um, the Sustainability Commission and the Parks Commission. We're planning on having a joint meeting. We were hoping May 5th, but we might ex uh, move that a um, couple weeks later. We'll let you know. I'll have Iris uh, send out an email. Uh, we're waiting for that report to come out, and then we'll take that report to council and see what they uh, what council would like to do in terms of all of our uh, soccer uh, soccer field projects. Um, one thing that I would like to note is if council and commission decide to um, have natural turf instead of artificial turf at both of these facilities, we cannot use DIF funds because DIF funds are eligible only for new amenities. And mm -hmm. since there are current um, natural grass fields at both locations, then we will need to look at other alternate funding sources to make those projects uh, happen. Um, so I wanted to point that out. Um, President Sardar Began, in regards to the shared use uh, facilities and after school programming that Mayor Kasakian had mentioned uh, during his opening statements a couple weeks ago, uh, we are meeting with um, Glenville Unified on, I believe, April 26 to review uh, shared uh, use and after school programming as well as uh, Glenville High School uh, tennis courts, the use of uh, Glenville High School tennis courts. And then last but not least, I would like to uh, invite and mention that on May 13th, uh, the Glendale Parks and Open Space Foundation will be having their annual Glendale Dodger Night. We do have tickets that are on sale. If anyone is interested in purchasing tickets, they could uh, uh, visit GlendaleDodgerNight.com or they can call Patty Bancourt at 818-548-2792, 818-548-2792. Nine two to purchase uh, their ticket. Uh, funds raised uh, will go back to the Glendale Parks and Open Space Foundation, who then will uh, sponsor a number of our recreation programs, trails and open space programs, and so on. So we hope to see you out there on May 13th. That's it. Thank you. Next item. Next item is oral communications, and we do not have I'll just check real quick. We don't have any callers. Next item. Consent items. The following are routine and may be acted upon by one motion. Any member of the commission or audience requesting separate consideration may do so by making such request before a motion is proposed. And um, at five, or we have approval of the minutes of the commission special meeting held on February 28th, 2022. So if Commission has had a chance to review the minutes. If anybody wants to um, move, I'd like to move that. <clears throat> Do we have a second? No, I'll second. I'll take roll call. Commissioners Alcazar? Yes. Alfayan? Yes. Meek? Yes. Wolfson's absent. President Sardar Bacon? Yes. Next item. We have action items. At 6A is a proposed adjusted and new fees for the Storm Barn Nature Center. It's a resolution repealing an existing fee and establishing new fees for the Storm Barn Nature Center and recommending that the Glendale City Council incorporated into the comprehensive citywide fee schedule. The changes made to the uh, CSP department-wide fee schedule effective May 18th. And Gabrielle Gauglia, our Senior Community Services Supervisor, has prepared a PowerPoint for us. Good afternoon, President Sardarbegian, members of the commission. I'm Gabrielle Golia. Um, I am here today to talk about the Stone Barn Nature Center. Um, I, we were very excited to open the barn on March 19th. Thank you all for coming and celebrating that great day with us. Um, we had a nice ribbon cutting ceremony. We had vendor booths. Um, private or uh, self-led tours of the barn um, and uh, lots of activities for families and visitors. Uh, staff coordinated shuttle vans to bring people up and down the hill during the event uh, due to limited parking. We had goodie bags available for all of the participants. Um, we had stainless steel reusable water bottles available for everybody. Um, stickers for their water bottles and giveaways at um, all of our booths. It was it was a really fun fun day. Uh, we had the climbing wall out there. This is a, a picture of the uh, grass area where we had the Glendale Rocks climbing wall. 
Um, and we had vendor booths uh, from both city-run organizations as well as volunteer organizations and our community partners in the area. Many of the vendor booths were um, staffed by uh, the organizations that do our Friday night lecture program with the Trails and Open Space um, and contribute to um, planting milkweed uh, plants to help the bees up at Duke Meade in Wilderness Park and, and other wonderful um, groups that support our operations and um, are supported by our operations. Uh, in addition, to, well, so this is a view of the inside of the barn. Um, we are now open for operation. We're open on Fridays from 3 to 6 p.m., Saturdays from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m., and Sundays from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Uh, in addition to those general hours of operation that we have going on, um, we're also working to expand programming. Uh, it, later in April, the Glendale Outdoors Go program, as part of the One Glendale program, will be visiting the barn for the first time. So we're gonna be starting our Go program visits at that point in time. Uh, the Go program, starting after the summer break with the, high, or the Glendale Unified School District, um, will be expanded, and it will be a monthly program where we will bring uh, families and children from South Glendale. We'll have some meeting points in South Glendale, and we'll provide buses to bring everybody up to the barn and enjoy um, our outdoor program. Uh, we'll also, as part of that, have an outdoor uh, education component, a hike, and a tour of the barn. Um, we provide snacks and arts and crafts for the participants, and it's going to be a free program. Uh, here's some people touring the barn um, as we were getting ready to open and, and as we've now opened. Um, so we're now working on our curriculum for the summer nature camp. We're going to be offering a four week specialty camp this summer. Um, it's going to run from June 20th through July 15th. And the weekly themes for this summer are the early bird and the worm, plant investigators, slithering and wriggling, and wilderness survival skills. So um, the kids will be, I think we think they're gonna have a really great time. We'll be utilizing the barn as well as the open space area and also even the ranch house as needed in order to accommodate the kids in the camp program. And as we get ready to um, open up, and part of this report is bringing some fees to you, um, we have an example of a layout of how we think we can set up the barn in order to um, have rentals in there for banquet style rentals. So um, the barn is going to be available for private events as well as um, uh, private events might include weddings, lectures, birthday parties. Um, we have the capability of doing small indoor rentals where we don't move the displays at all and large indoor rentals where we do have to move those displays out of the way in order to set up something like you're seeing here with the um, banquet style setup. <clears throat> we are um, proposing at this point in time that for larger rentals that require movement of the displays that we are going to rent out the barn one weekend per month for those larger rentals. Um, and that's so that we don't have to move the displays regularly. They are pricey. Um, and they're delicate, and so we wanna give this a shot and see how we can rent it out and how it is to move those displays regularly, but we only wanna do it once per weekend, so we'll move everything out of the way, rent it out for a couple days to private renters, and then move everything back at the end of that weekend. That way we reduce the number of times that we're moving those displays back and forth and reduce the potential for damage to them. Uh, we do have an interest list of people who already want to rent the center for private events. Um, so we will be working off of that list when we get started with rentals. <clears throat> we are proposing that that weekend, the first weekend of each month, with the exception of July, is the weekend that we will do all of our big rentals and make it available for the large ones. Small rentals will be available anytime. If we don't have to move the displays, if it's available and nobody else has rented it, then we can go ahead and rent it out. Um, and that way we uh, make it available for little birthday parties or lectures where people wanna sit at a table, but they don't have to move displays all around the place. For the larger rentals, we are recommending a six hour minimum. Um, and that way it, again, minimizes the number of times we have to move things in and out. And it guarantees that it is a larger rental that, um, makes the potential for damage, it kind of it balances that potential for damage for us. Okay, so the fees that we are talking about changing, um, we already had 
a regular rental standard rate of $200 per hour. We're not looking to change that. Along with that rate was a nonprofit discount or a commercial rate that's 150% of the standard rate. Um, those rate, those prices we don't want to talk, we don't want to move, we don't want to change those. Those would be for the smaller rentals, the birthday parties, the um, private meetings that want to use it, a lecture that wants to come in um, and they want to have just their own guests where nobody else can enter the barn at that time. Um, we don't, we're not looking to change the uh, deposits for the rentals, the $1,000 uh, for an event without alcohol or $2,000 with alcohol. We are proposing, or we did propose when we brought the fees to you um, back in September, that higher deposit when there's alcohol because of the risk of alcohol being spilled or people getting um, a little bit more wild, <laughs> bumping into something, damaging those displays. So the new fees that we are proposing for the rental rates is uh, a $2,000 flat rate for up to six hours. If they wanna go above the six hours, then the $200 rate that we already have approved would uh, be applicable at that time. Um, the nonprofit rate, which is 75% of it, is $1,500 for a flat rate for six hours, or commercial, $3,000 for the flat rate. Along with the um, rentals, we realized that we needed to clean up um, the tour rates that we had had approved back in September. Um, we, we did some learning as we've had the barn open and seeing what really goes into it and what people are really interested in. Um, so one of the fees we did not include originally was the patio. We've realized that we can add that patio in. A birthday party could conceivably be just out on the patio and wanna come into the barn, or it could be an area that people wanna tack on to a larger rental. So we are proposing a $40 per hour fee for the patio that matches with the amphitheater or picnic table rentals. So it's, it's in line with the other facility. Uh, the nonprofit rate is 75% of that and the commercial rate is 150% of that. Um, we had a, a, what was called the Stone Barn Nature Center private tour fee, which originally was a four hour fee for up to 30 participants. Um, we'd like to repeal that fee and change it. Um, and create two different tour fees. And the reason for that is, for starters, it doesn't take four hours to tour the barn. <laughs> that was a very lofty goal there. Um, the barn, once we've seen people in it, most people are in there for about 30 to 45 minutes touring it. Um, so we are, we are proposing that the new private tour fee is a two hour time period. That gives people time to tour it on their own, talk with their friends, look at things, take their time, um, but it's not this huge long commitment to it. Um, so we are proposing that for a private tour, it's a two hour uh, flat rate of $250. There's no maximum participants on that. So a larger group could come if they were renting, say, the amphitheater for a lecture and just wanted to come in and have private use of the barn, then that 250 would be for all the people that they have. <clears throat> the other tour, interpretive program that we're proposing is a $250 interpretive activity. So this would be a recreational component where up to 20 children could come in. So let's say they wanted to rent the patio and have an interpretive activity as part of their birthday party. We would provide an hour and a half of activities for up to 20 children. Each child after that 20 would be an additional $10. And the activities would be a lead hike, a 30 minute hike up Mummy Rock, 30 minutes of arts and crafts, and a 30 minute educational component that is something about the barn. And we can work with the renters on, is there a specific part of the barn you really want us to talk about or all of it at once? Um, so that is the new uh, second part of the tour fees that we're proposing. Uh, the fiscal impact for this, we're anticipating a, a little bit more revenue to come in because of these larger rentals. Uh, originally, when we presented this to you back in September, we had a, a number that was inclusive of all of our rental revenue and class and camps. Um, just the rental portion of it was 99840 back in September. We think now rentals will be <clears throat> approximately 114000 That is the end of my prepared presentation. I'm happy to answer questions. The Patio uh, fee, if you wanted to extend, is in addition to the regular fee, correct? President Sardabagian, yes, um, and Commissioner Meek, yes, <laughs> it is uh, in addition to that or on its own. If a small birthday party wanted to just rent the patio, even if it was during open hours of the barn, they could rent just that outside patio area, like on a weekend afternoon. 
I love how thorough you are with you know the full explanation of the fees and everything so detailed. My question is, um, what about food? Are you guys allowing for any food to be served within the barn? And if so, preparation of the food. Is that something that uh, it needs to just kind of be catered, uh, prepared outside of you know the entire facility and brought in, or there's you know some kind of explanation of that? Sure, President Sardarbeg and members of the commission, um, we do not have a kitchen on site, so food would either have to come in if they had a food truck style way of preparing the food themselves, they could prepare it on site. Um, otherwise, it would have to be catered. We are allowing food inside. Um, that's part of the reason the, the uh, deposits are higher than most facility rentals. Um, but we will allow food inside the building for those purposes. During general hours of operation, we don't. Um, and then any catering or food preparation, any, any business that comes in does have to provide insurance that's approved by the city's risk manager before they're allowed to come on site to either cook or serve. And if I may ask another question, um, as far as uh, I know the hours you said, but um, especially during summer and the numerous other summer camps that are kind of locally going on, if camps want to bring, you know, kids on a field trip over there, um, how would that work as far as within the hours and getting, you know, kind of some of the tours and just overall, is that something that's been thought about? Um, yes, President Sardarbegian, it is, um, that would fall under that private tour rate of $250 for the flat rate. Um, so if a camp, for instance, wanted to bring a field trip up to the facility if from Burbank or another city, a private camp, um, they could come up, use the grass area, bring kids in, in in somewhat smaller groups during the week if they wanted to. Um, since it is a two hour uh, flat fee, let's say the camp is too big to allow the whole camp in at once, it might be pretty chaotic if they brought 200 kids in. Um, so we might recommend uh, that you know they come in shifts of 75 kids at a time or smaller groups in order to rotate them through, but we wouldn't charge them every time they come through. We would just say, okay, let's fit it into a two hour period. Um, and then with the local schools, we are looking to expand our programming in the fall once the schools are back in session and inviting the schools up for some tours. Um, if it's a local Glendale school, our goal would be to have that for free for the schools. If they wanna add on the um, recreational component, that inter the interpretive activity, then there may be a fee associated with it because we have staff and equipment and materials. But as long as they're coming up for school field trips, then there would be no fee for those. We are, we're going to be working with GUSD to expand that. And I'm glad you said equipment because that was my next question. As far as for any of the um, the larger scaled um, events and stuff, um, do we are are we providing or is it um, is it something that you guys are providing chairs, tables, and everything, or is that an outside rental company that uh, will be used to accommodate? Uh, so we will have tables and chairs, and we have black tablecloths, somewhat similar to what you're seeing in here, where they wrap around the table. Um, anything outside of that, then the customers will need to bring it in, whether they have an event planner who brings it in, or if they bring in a, a rental company. Um, and again, insurance, we would just need the insurance from the companies who are coming onto the property. But we will provide the basics of the tables and chairs, and we will set it up as part of the rental. So whatever the customer is looking for as far as a banquet setup or a lecture setup, um, we will have that um, ready to go upon the start of their rental period. So that six hours minimum would also include their setup and cleanup time. Um, so if they have three hours worth of decorating to do, then part of that six hours is the three hours of setup. And hopefully my last question, sure. um, any um, amplified music or anything of that nature, is that allowed? And if so, um, let's just say for a wedding, is there, what's the cutoff time? I understand the six hours, but um, are, they go, are they allowed to go later on throughout the night or is that just a flat you know, cutoff period time-wise? Um, so President Sardarbegin, we will be allowing amplified sound inside the barn um, if they have a DJ for a wedding reception that they wanna bring um, to play music and a dance floor. We have um, the setup that I showed you in the presentation is just one possibility of a setup. We actually have four or five that we've kind of already plotted out. Um, and so they will be allowed to play music. The latest will allow reservations on the weekend nights is 11 p.m. at this point in time. And that's to help prevent issues with the neighbors because it is a residential, quiet residential neighborhood. So we don't want to have lots of people going down the hill late at night. Um, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, Onig, the, the sound cutoff for 
uh, centers is 10 p.m., an hour before the end of the rental period. So we will ask that that amplified sound comes down beginning at 10 p.m. Thank you. Okay, it's my turn. <laughs> um, no, I you know, also just wanted to congratulate the department again um, on this huge feat of opening the Stone uh, Barn Nature Center. I know it was years in the making. Um, and that's exciting that we're already getting inquiries on renting the space. It's, it was, it's a very beautiful space overlooking you know, the mountains and into the, the valley. Um, I did appreciate seeing that the city provided nonprofit rates. Um, I wanted to understand how that rate is determined. It sounded like 75% seemed like a standard is across, is that all uh, parks services? Uh, yes, President Sardarekian, um, members of the commission, it is it is a standard discount that we give okay. for nonprofits. Um, it's a 25% discount, so they pay 75% okay. of the standard rate. Um, Prices are set by or approved by the commission. Um, so s there are a few differences here and there where it may not be a set 25% uh, discount, but um, that is the standard across the majority of our facilities. Okay. Um, has there, from your other um, services and, and rentals provided, has there been um, challenges with other organizations trying to rent some of the spaces because the cost was too high um, from your experience? Um, we we find that all the facilities are rented at all the different rate yeah. uh, rates set. Um, if a particular organization um, ha is fundraising for something or has a challenge, um, then sometimes they fill out a request for fee consideration and it's considered. Okay. Um, however, it's not a standard yeah. discount given. No, no, I appreciate that there's an option um, to give consideration for you know um, smaller nonprofits that mm -hmm. might not. Uh, have uh, as much capacity to, to afford these types of things. Um, you did mention schools and working with USD, so that was actually one of my questions. Um, but what about other, uh, maybe private schools or um, in LAUSD, do they, are they considered nonprofit organizations too? Is that something that you uh, kind of work with them? Um, President Sardarbeggi and members of the commission, we, we're not, um, we haven't looked at outside of Glendale city limits. Typically our discounts are given or the um, programming and, and scholarship type programs are given to schools that are within the Glendale Unified School District boundary. So we would yeah. look at private schools within the boundaries here in Glendale um, for some of those programs. And then we would look at um, certainly being able to work with schools outside of Glendale. There just may be some of the standard fees associated with them, the rental tour fees. Um, right. That uh, since they're not Glendale, uh, located here in Glendale, we may look at that. Um, okay. Or if they're nonprofit, then they would um, certainly be eligible to apply for a nonprofit discount. Okay. Um, another question for staffing. Uh, between, because I understand that you're separating uh, this private tour category into two, um, which is a shorter private tour and then the interpretive activity, uh, and they're at the same rate. So do you anticipate that that would uh, require the same amount of staffing um, for either uh, activity? Um, I, we believe or we are anticipating that a private tour would probably require fewer staff than an interpretive activity. Um, the interpretive activity would require at least one person to be there to help oversee the, the facility itself while the other person is providing the actual recreational component. And if we have more than 20 kids, then we may need multiple staff. So it, it may be rental dependent. It may just depend on how many kids are part of a party. Whereas a private tour, um, depending on which staff person it is, whether it's a lead staff or a support staff, um, we may only need one person to be there to open the facility and um, ensure that everything is working and safe. So um, that's why it's um, we have unlimited people that can come to that private tour versus putting a limitation and a time, a shorter time limit on the smaller groups. But it's the same okay. thing because it's a little yeah. more intense. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's it for me. Are we planning to have camp uh, program up there, uh, the day day camp or something for the summer? Yes, President Sardarbeki and members of the commission, the, the camp is scheduled to begin on June 20th. 
Um, the camp will be offered Monday through Friday from, the camp itself will be from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. and we will have before care and after care options for parents who need extra time. So before care will run from 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. and after care will run from 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. So care will be available to parents from 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. daily. And uh, how, how many, how long is the program for different weeks? How many weeks we're gonna have? Uh, we will offer this program for four weeks. During the summer? Yes, it is a specialty camp. Um, so it's not a program that we're anticipating is um, a true child care program where parents have to send their children every day so they can go to work. It's more of a supplemental program. Um, so we're going to start off this summer with a four week program and see how it goes. In the age group, uh, what's the age group in this? Um, age group for this one, I believe, I apologize, I don't have it in front of me. Just, I think uh, we have gone from um, six years old to 14 years old. Okay. okay I have a few more questions if sure. we have time. Uh, when we're talking about removal of the uh, displays, where are we moving them? Do we have a special uh, place to move them uh, safely and then bring them back? Thank you. Um, Okay, so um, we, we cannot move them out of the actual building. They will stay inside. Um, they are designed to roll. Um, I'm not sure, do I have a light? Oh, you can't see it on there. Um, no, it's not showing up on the screen. Um, so Teresa is pointing with the arrow to the edges of the room mm -hmm. where the displays will be rolled to and pushed to the side. Um, so the displays will still be visible unless a customer wishes to mask them in some way. Um, we've looked at which side we want to have facing out, which side we want to have facing away. Um, for instance, there's the one large display that has the map on it when it you know, leans out. So the map folds up um, and the map side would be pushed against the wall. I think Teresa is showing it on the... Yeah, it's, it, so that whole centerpiece of three actually breaks into three different pieces, and each one will roll to the sides to be flush up against the walls. They're on the wheels? Uh, they are on casters, yes. Is there something to protect them uh, at the same time? Because um, you, you'll be having, how many, what's the capacity on this? I see like you have uh, about 11 tables. Correct. Um, the capacity is approximately 11 tables. We are waiting on our delivery of tables and chairs so we can actually physically set them up in the room, which is why we haven't started taking rentals quite yet, because we want to, while we've drafted how the tables and chairs will look inside the room, we haven't actually seen it live and done it ourselves. So we do want to have some experience setting it up in a couple of different configurations, but we believe that the max capacity is approximately 88 in there. Um, at, and that's without a dance floor, that would be just a banquet style tables and chairs. Um, at this point in time, there is not anything to protect the displays that are up against the wall. So the displays with interactive um, components are going to be turned to face the wall so that the part that is um, facing out is less likely to be damaged as well as easier to repair should something happen. Okay. Uh if we be moving them around, maybe we should set a date, like on weekends, saying Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, it's removed all together. So you save on the, uh, on the work, uh, on the employees. And I'm sure you'll be having a lot of uh, demand for this, for weddings and so on. And at the same time, when you have this, the, at the patio, it will be used automatically. So we should join it together if they're renting something inside. Maybe they have to pay for the patio automatically. So. President Sardarbegian and members of the commission, um, if, if you feel that the patio should be part of the actual rental, um, that's certainly something that um, can be recommended. We had it separate so that um, it would be Depending on the size or the use, a lecturer may not want to use the patio, so therefore we didn't automatically include it in there. But um, we also wanted to keep it separate for the purpose of smaller birthday parties or other little standalone things, um, but it would always be available. But you can have both, I guess. I suggest to have both of them. Yes. 
And we did, um, we, we are also proposing that um, we only do rentals the first weekend of the month, with the exception of July, which will be the last weekend of the month due to the summer camp. And it's for exactly what um, you were suggesting, is that we move all of the displays out of the way on, say, Thursday, do rentals all weekend long, and then move all the displays back on Monday, um, and then be done for the rest of the month so that we limit the amount of moving we do and the staff time. How are you going to handle if you have two functions, one during the lunch, uh, luncheon and then one in the evening? Uh, that is a very good question. We are limiting it to one rental per day for that reason. It's, we can't do, we're, we'll be unable with the, the staffing and the um, experience and, and just the nature of that room to handle more than one rental per day. And with that six hour minimum, that is part of why we, we set the minimum longer is because we really can only do one large rental. I'm not uh, understanding when you say $2,000 rental against the $3,000. Commercial and then the others are private. So when it becomes commercial, when somebody rents, for, rents it for somebody else and they bring their own uh, guest, or I am uh, throwing my own party there, I am uh, private, I'm just gonna pay $2,000. Uh, President Sardabegian, members of the commission, that is typically a fee that we charge to film permits. Um, so the commercial fee is one where they are coming in to um, utilize our facility for a film permit. Um, it, we typically don't charge it for a private rental, even if they were, say, fundraising for something. Um, we're not typically charging them the commercial rate for that use. Um, it's typically really, in my experience, has um, more been used for film permits um, Pretty much exclusively. Okay, that makes it more uh, reasonable. Okay, uh, my recommendations are to consider if we, as we go on, I'm sure we can develop other things uh, to make it more smooth operation for you. Thank you. President Sardar Begin, members of the commission, um, just like Commissioner Kofayan, you suggested, this is very new to the staff, so this is kind of our recommendation based on what we've seen so far. It definitely is not set in stone, and as we realize it's a lot easier than we thought or a lot harder than we thought, we'll be right here in front of you asking you for some sort of a change. So like you suggested, um, the six-hour minimum, the reason why we required a six-hour minimum is, one, we think a larger event like a wedding is going to require a couple of hours of setup, especially if they bring an event planner, and a couple hours of cleanup afterwards. So if um, we don't require the six hours, then we're essentially losing out on a couple of hours of another event we could host. So that's why we figured if the event is important enough and if this location is important enough for the individual, then if we do a six hour minimum, then we don't have to worry about, quote unquote, losing out on another opportunity because we will have had that six hour minimum for a rental. Now, if there are, if we realize that we're not really getting requests for larger events, we're getting smaller requests, then we'll reduce that six hour minimum for smaller requests and maybe have two different events, one in the morning and then one in the afternoon and try to maximize that. So this is really going to be our opportunity to test out um, what we as staff think we're going to need. Because one of the challenges was we, as we, when we brought you the fees in September, we still hadn't seen the setup for the exhibits. So we brought up, brought the report, we had the fees established, and then we realized when the exhibits were in that it's really not that easy to roll those exhibits out of the way. And so if we were going to have three, four events every weekend, every time staff is moving those exhibits on roller, we have the potential of, uh, of damaging it. And, and I'm not sure if Gabrielle mentioned it or not, but just the map display that we had, I think was over $60,000. $60, and so damaging that display is going to be really difficult for us to have to replace or even fix. So that's why we figured if we at least, um, like you suggested, limited to a weekend of rentals, then that way we're, we are only moving it once and keeping it out of the way. We'll have other events, smaller events, where the exhibits don't have to be moved. So it's not just one weekend of events, but it's just one weekend of all the exhibits out of the way um, events. We will still have opportunities for someone who wants to rent the patio and leave the exhibits as is and you know have a little birthday party or some sort of a Cub Scout event or some sort of a meet business meeting where they have the event outside because summer's coming, it'll be beautiful, um, and they'll want to have you know, tables um, set up outside and then just kind of walk in and mingle and look at the displays and 
um, and or bring the kids in to, to, be, to do some sort of an activity indoors. So this is all um, basically what we think is going to make it most efficient and safe for the operations for now. And then as we are able to um, operate for maybe six months to a year, we'll be back here to report on what we found to be successful and what the challenges are if we need to make other accommodations. So thank you. It will be, uh, what's our goal is, is to raise more money or not? That's the, where, where we, we are, if we're gonna raise more money, we have to work, at, look at it. <laughs> Maybe you have four hours during the lunch hour, and then you have six hours for dinner. You know, <laughs> as we go on, we'll experience those. Yeah, President Tartar Bacon, members of the commission, at this point, I think our goal is to bring the, the kids in and share the, the facility. I think the rentals are just um, extra because we know that people are going to want to have rent it for events. I think our goal is to really operate it as a nature center more so than an event venue. Um, Obviously, the revenue is important because it will help us offset the costs. But I, at this point, at least from my perspective, and I believe Mr. Bulanikin would agree that it's the goal isn't necessarily to to make the most revenue at this time. It's to operate it as a nature center, and if we can bring in revenue to help off those, offset those costs, because obviously the general fund is funding it, Measure S actually is funding it at this point, um, the entire operation. I think that would be great. So. I may add one or two more questions sure. um, before we get someone to move uh, the motion. Um, as far as smoking is concerned, I, is it safe to assume that the entire facility is a smokeless? Perfect, okay. Um, <laughs> yes, to, to answer for people at home, President Sardarbegian, members of the commission, the entire park is um, smoke-free. There is no smoking allowed in any of our parks, um, and that's a curb-to-curb -curb ban, so, or in this case, curb-to-mountain. Perfect, perfect. Okay, that makes sense. And then lastly, I believe there is a large uh, open field um, within the, the, the Wilderness Center. Um, has there ever been any talks of possibly hosting outside events over there, especially, you know, the summer months where we have, you know, 90 degree weather until like 9 or 10 p.m. So, um, you know, I, I understand that the, the rental rates here are all for using the actual nature center itself. But what about the open field for, you know, larger uh, capacity events? Have you guys put any thought into it? Or if not, maybe that might be another added, uh, you know. Neighbors, you have to think about the neighbors. True. <laughs> uh, President Sardarbegin, we, we do, um, we have rented out the meadow, which is, I believe, the area you're referring to above the, the barn, the grass area. Correct. Um, we have a, an acreage fee that is available for um, renting that grass area. We've had some um, events up there that um, we've, we have a meditation group that has used it. We've had many film permits use it, and certainly if a group came to us and wanted to have an outdoor wedding ceremony up there and a reception inside the barn, some kind of... Um, uh, co-use of the facility, we, we would consider it. Um, and we also rent out the picnic table shelters in the lower grass area as well. So we have multiple opportunities for indoor and outdoor use up there. Parking is, of course, our biggest challenge. So whatever we do, we do have to keep in mind that um, we can't necessarily rent out both the wedding, the meadow for, say, a wedding and the barn at the same time, because um, as many of you saw at the opening, um, we had to provide a shuttle just to be able to do that. So we may have to work with renters on some kind of um, them providing some kind of valet shuttle because of parking issues. We're, we haven't really crossed that yet. It will be a learning experience. Uh, I'm glad you brought up smoking. Uh, as someone who spends his Sunday mornings picking up trash, uh, all the parks have people smoking in them. I'm concerned about smoking on a private event inside the barn. And how would you prevent that? Uh, so President Sarda became members of the commission. The, the events inside the barn will be staffed. So there will be staff right there preventing anyone from smoking. Um, if we had some kind of issue where people are smoking, and this isn't for outside as well. We have staff who will be walking the whole facility, and we have caretakers who do, li do live up there. So if we had a problem where um, people were refusing to stop smoking, um, we would contact the police to come up and cite them because there is, uh, there is an ordinance. There's a smoking ordinance. So um, as long as the police are available to come up and help for something along those lines um, at that moment, then um, we would have them come up. Sometimes there is a slight delay. 
on arrival times if they have a big emergency, but um, we would certainly contact them if we needed assistance enforcing the rules. Thank you. I'm ready to move it. Uh, I believe we have one, one more, more, uh, more comment. comment. I'm assuming that, uh, you know, a mention of it in the contract, this non-smoking policy is, could also be yeah, a solution there. Um, but my other uh, comment, uh, I know this is, uh, our decision is related to the rental rates and fee schedule, um, but I wanted to take the opportunity to comment on the um, educational curriculum for the summer camps and, and future programs. Um, I would like to encourage and advise uh, that we build the curriculum with the Indigenous Tongva Nation. Um, so visitors can learn about their displacement um, from this land, uh, but also of how their ecological practices of their ancestors um, uh, and how we can kind of learn from um, their, you know, uh, kind of historical and traditional practices um, with the environment up there. Um, I think that would be a, an amazing opportunity to um, partner with them. President Sardovicki and members of the commission, absolutely. We can um, definitely build in educational components to all of our programs that have to do with um, the history of the area, the history of the people in the area, and um, the environment and nature, um, and how we can be good stewards of our backyard. Amazing, thank you. And with that, I'm also ready to move. So ready. I okay. can move to, let me pull up the text. <laughs> to uh, adopt the resolution establishing these new fees um, and adjusting existing fees for the Stone Barn Nature Center and recommending that the Glendale City Council incorporate into the citywide fee schedule the changes made by the department-wide fee schedule. I'm seconding. Please. I'll take roll call. Commissioner Zalkazar? Yes. Alfayan? Yes. Meek? Yes. Wolfson's absent. President Sardarbegian? Yes. Next item. Next item is reports for information only. At 7 8, we have Recreation and Community Services Section Monthly Activity Report for February and March, since we um, did not have a March meeting. And here to present is Seva Garbedian, our Senior Community Services um, Supervisor. Good afternoon, President uh, Sardar Begin, members of the Commission City staff. My name is Savag Garabedian, Senior Supervisor with the Department. So we're going to go through the months of February and March. Um, we do um, every month when we meet. So COVID-19, what's open, what's closed. Uh, commissioners, I'll be happy to report that with the most recent update in the county protocols for mask requirements in, in indoor, changing it from required to strongly encouraged. Um, that was our trigger point, bringing just about all of our programs back to in-person activities. So the last two programs that weren't taking place due to uh, the COVID protocols, one of them was taught time, and taught time is now back, um, and the other one is youth drop-in sports. Uh, and youth drop-in sports weren't being uh, played during um, the masking requirement because youth sports also had the mandatory weekly testing requirement, which we weren't able to enforce in our facilities to know who is showing up to a drop-in sports program that is tested or that isn't tested. So with the masking requirement change, everything else kind of went off the wayside, allowing us to go back to pre-pandemic uh, pandemic activity levels. Gabrielle already talked about the Stone Bar Nature Center grand opening. Uh, we also had two uh, special events following that, uh, that one. So the first one was the 20th annual Cesar Chavez commemorative event at Pacific Community Center in Chavez Plaza. And the next one was the annual spring extravaganza that was on April 9th, also at Pacific Community Center on the outdoor basketball court and um, baseball field. Uh, so instead of showing pictures about these two, our colleagues at GTV6 prepared videos that I want to share with you guys. Uh, so let's get that up and running on the computer if we can. Hopefully um, YouTube doesn't disappoint us.
one more, which is the spring extravaganza. invite Robert F. Kennedy to come to that hearing and to preside over it. So commissioners, as you could see, um, videos do a lot more justice to those big special events. Um, turnout for both events was greater than what we had originally anticipated. Fortunately, we were able to be prepared and staff respectively. Um, the staff who were uh, organizing that event for for one of them it was their first time so they underestimated what i told them you need about 2500 eggs for the ages four and younger group <laughs> um really quickly we we made the adjustment for the five and younger and, and and adjusted respectively um it takes about 20 seconds for those eggs to get picked up it takes about five to ten minutes to, for you to spread out the eggs on that field but nonetheless everybody had fun so moving forward, we still had our child care programs. Uh, during the month of February and uh, March, we had a parents' night out at Pacific Community Center. Um, we had over 30 participants at parents' night out. It was a Valentine's Day themed event. Um, and we basically, um, last minute, added more staff, uh, added a third staff member so we could accommodate up to 30 kids um, and let parents have a night out uh, from 6 p.m. to midnight on their own, whatever they wanted to do, and we took care of the kids. And then during spring break, we had two day camps. One was at Pacific Community Center. The other one was at Spar Heights Community Center. Spar Heights Community Center had 21 participants in their half day camp and Pacific had 90 participants in their full day camp. Um, this is usually offered when GUSD is out on spring break. And one new addition that we brought to Spar this year that we weren't able to do in years past for whatever reason, um, we reached out to our uh, colleagues over at Gondo Unified School District and asked for use of their playground uh, since school's not in session, at least the kids at SPAR have a place to play because SPAR is just a facility. There's no outdoor green space for them to run around. So we use Fremont Elementary School's playground for the kids to go out and uh, have fun and have some recreation other than just being stuck in the building or walking to Montrose Park, where, what we've done in the past. We had four virtual presentations for seniors uh, during the last two months. Uh, topics included Medicare is complicated, don't be a victim to fraud, uh, memory loss, and the role of nutrition as we age. So this year marks the 50th anniversary of our senior nutrition program. Uh, a, city pro a city council proclamation will be presented on May 10, 2020 um, to kick off the reopening of our meal sites and to celebrate 50 years of the elderly nutrition program. Having said that, on March 31st, LA County WEDEX, Workforce Development, Aging, and Community Services informed the city uh, that in-person congregate meal dining will be able to resume upon submission and approval of an elderly nutrition program uh, reopening plan and a checklist. Our staff uh, submitted that reopening plan and uh, we already received approval. Um, the, just briefly, staff uh, proposed using a hybrid model, uh, using a model of the meal service in the reopening plan, which will continue to offer grab-and-go lunch pickup. And for seniors who are not yet comfortable with in-person dining, and in-person dining for up to 50% capacity at our meals locations. So there are three meals locations that we currently have, Spar Heights Community Center, Adult Recreation Center, and Pacific Community Center. So Pacific Community Center operates Monday, Wednesday, Friday. They'll be at 50% capacity on those three days. Spar Heights Community Center um, typically operates Monday through Friday. They'll be at 50% capacity for in-person dining, and then the, other, uh, the seniors who aren't able to eat in person for whatever reason, if we're beyond our capacity, they could still grab their grab and go lunch and, and go somewhere else to eat. Um, and at ARC, it'll be the same model. The only difference at ARC is on Saturdays and Sundays, we're still doing grab and go only 
on the weekends. So Monday through Friday, they could do in-person, Saturday, Sunday, it's grab and go only. So our reopening is scheduled for Monday, May 16. Hopefully um, it'll be a good one. May is Older Americans Month as well, so it'll be a good way for our seniors to finally come back after about two years and two months, if I'm not mistaken, um, of remaining out of the building for meals. As of March 2022, staff is serving an average of 10,160 meals per month uh, in the altered congregate meals uh, program and 1,250 meals a month in the traditional home delivered meals program. Moving forward, trails and open space programs. The department held one volunteer work day and one interpretive program. The Friday night lecture was bears in mind and 20 people attended the event. The Riverwalk work day prepared the park for the uh, celebrate spring at uh, Riverwalk, uh, which took place on April, uh, April 2. Uh, volunteers weeded invasive plants, removed as much graffiti as possible, and clean up interpretive signs and kiosks. 24 One Glendale After School Youth Sports Program participants went to Glendale Outdoors uh, Go program at the Glendale Sports Complex uh, for their morning of nature education. They went on a light hike around the sports complex, uh, participated in a craft activity, uh, had a light snack, and uh, an opportunity to explore that facility. Our Youth and Family Services program continued to have uh, its STAR meetings on a weekly basis. Uh, during the month of February and March, our STAR students um, were able to celebrate the holidays and listen to presentations by Glendale Unified School District. Our Teen Night Out programs continued at Maple Park and at Pacific Community Center. Uh, along the same lines, they celebrated Valentine's Day, St. Patrick's Day, Mardi Gras, had presentations uh, regarding COVID-19 and various other topics uh, per, specific to the teen population. Maple All-Inclusive Play Day um, also took place on February 19 and on March 19. And then our therapeutic recreation program um, in the month of February had its dance and fitness night. And then in March, they had their annual bingo night. Upcoming events, uh, if you haven't seen it on social media, you might see it soon. Um, we are working with Gundal Community College, Gundal Unified School District, and various other city departments uh, to go out and recruit uh, staff for our upcoming summer programs and our seasonal programs. Uh, the positions we're currently hiring for are recreation leaders, which work our summer camp programs, for example, uh, facility attendants that work at our facilities, um, lifeguards, uh, skate park attendants, et cetera, et cetera. So, we are in desperate need to get our programs fully staffed before the season comes around. So we're just doing a bigger job of promoting these events. We already spent the last two weeks going to our local uh, high schools and trying to reach out to our graduating seniors and uh, encouraging them to apply. Um, and the next stop is Glendale Community College next Tuesday in virtual to present the uh, opportunities and then on Thursday to do on-site interviews. So you'll see that going on. That's our staff working on that. And then upcoming is summer day camp registration. Registration for Glendale residents will begin on April 25, 2022. Unlike years past, this will be online, in person, and over the phone. Whereas typically in the past, we've only done in person exclusively. Uh, with COVID-19, there's a lot of good stuff that we were able to take away. A lot of business practices needed to be altered. One of that was our day camp registration going exclusively to online. And we're continuing that moving forward because now that we have over two years of experience in our EdCamp program on online registration, we could implement that. So April 25 for Gundal residents, they'll get priority registration and Gundal resident pricing. April 27, general registration begins. Uh, as is with every year, um, we determine residency uh, and priority based on residency verification. So Gundal residents, who want to register their children into our program need to verify their residency. It's as simple as providing um, last two utility bills, GWP bills, SoCal gas bills, uh, and emailing it to CSB customer service uh, at glendalca.gov, or they could call us over the phone and we could walk them through that. Everybody needs to re-up on their residency verification to get their priority registration, and it should be done before registration day, before logging in and discovering that they're not getting the priority or the resident discount. Glendale Dodger Night, as Mr. Bulanikan uh, mentioned, is going to be on Friday, May 13. Uh, tickets are available, glendaleparksfoundation.org, for more information. 
summer concerts in the park. Uh, they are coming back. We just announced our uh, lineup for uh, 2022. Uh, we're gonna have a tribute to Frank Sinatra, a foreigner tribute, an 80s night, uh, the Peshmo tribute band, a Cuban salsa night, and then a flamenco Catalan ramba night. Summer concerts in the park take place at Verdugo Park Wednesday evenings from 7 p.m. to 9 p.m. They start on July 6th, and the last one will be on August 10, 2022. And then the last thing I wanna talk about is, as you see us at various upcoming events, um, and our department has a marketing booth, what we're trying to do is kind of um, streamline our marketing booth and reduce the amount of paper and the preparation time to print that paper uh, to get all these flyers and brochures and programs advertised during those events. So what we're doing is working with our colleagues at our graphics department in creating a um, five item QR code that leads people to our various programs so they could get their information electronically. Um, and this is what you're gonna see pretty soon at our marketing tables. This, the first time you'll see it is on April 23 during the Earth Day event at Artsakh Paseo. And then moving forward, this is the type of information we'll have at our marketing booth. There'll be postcard sized ones so people could take home and refer to them uh, after they leave the event but essentially we're trying to minimize how much paper we're printing, generating, and constantly having to maintain as events are taking place, that becomes trash, gets recycled, new ones are being printed, and we're just trying to reduce all of that effort and energy. And that completes my presentation, if anybody has any questions. Thank you for that report. Um, I did have a follow-up question on uh, the senior nutrition program. Uh, I know that uh, it was presented in past meetings on how it will move forward, but could you just summarize? Um, I know it's grown over COVID and has really expanded to um, also at-home deliveries. Mm -hmm. Will that continue while the facilities are opening up? <laughs> sure, Pre President Sardar Reagan, uh, com uh, Commissioner Alcazar, I'm gonna ask Maggie Kavrian okay. to uh, answer that question. She is the meals guru at the end. Good afternoon, President Sardabeg and members of the commission. I'm Maggie Kavarian, Senior Community Services Supervisor. I oversee the Elderly Nutrition Program. Um, to answer your question, we've always had our home delivered meals program in operation, and that program in itself, better known as Meals on Wheels, most people know as, as Meals on Wheels, that program has been in operating, has been operating um, consistently since COVID. But before that, we would serve about a thousand meals. We're noticing that our seniors who used to participate in our congregate meals program are now transitioning to being homebound. So we're anticipating higher levels of our home delivered meals clients and the tapering off of our congregate meals clients. We are in the process right now in our reopening plan to make cold calls to all our participants and it seems that the participants do want to come back. Um, we actually had a meeting this morning with our Los Angeles County um, Nutrition Services, and it does really seem that most, I would want to say about 75% as of today, want to come back for in-person dining. But okay. we're going to continue to keep the grab-and-go option for those seniors who are still not comfortable yet in returning. So to answer your question, I hope that answers yes. your question. Yeah, that's great. It is a dual program, congregate and um, home delivered. Yeah, no, it sounds like you've, um, again, picked up the capacity over shifting the, the pandemic uh, needs and are continuing to try and provide those services. That's great. Um, I'm also just really great to hear that you're shifting uh, registration for camps online because I have had to go take off time and go in person to that GCC campus to um, stand in line and register my son for summer camp. So thanks. Sure, no problem. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Next item. 7B is Park Services Section Monthly Activity Report for January and February 22nd. And Coco Panosian will have a presentation for us. Thank you. Good afternoon, President Sardar Began, members of commission. For the month of January, we completed 732 work orders for non-routine work, of which 710 were completed by groundskeepers, eight for pasted application, and 14 by the irrigation crew for total labor hours of 1,315. 
In the month of February, we had 959 work orders, of which 907 were completed by groundskeepers, three for pass that application, and 49 work orders by the irrigation repair crew for total labor hours of 1,150. And for the past couple of months, we have, we wanted to highlight a couple of projects, one larger scale and a few that were small scale projects yet necessary, and wanted to show you uh, the pictures of those projects. Okay, I, th I think I had the wrong one still. The recreation was so great, I might have to show it again. <laughs> what happened to yours? There we are. <laughs> Sorry about that. So, um, Las Flores Motorway is one of our uh, trails off its north of Verdugo. It actually, this motorway connects to the Brand Motorway at one point, so it literally connects the open space between Brand and Verdugo Park. We had a lot of people that would um, hike this area, the residents nearby, and as you notice, this gate is full-on locked. This is a fire road. We don't allow pedestrians and vehicles to actually go through, uh, vehicles and or bicycles. However, we have individuals that hike it, and this entire thing was sidewalk to sidewalk lock with no access. So people have to, you know, bend under the bars to be able to access it. And finally, we got, uh, we held a meeting with uh, our fire folks and we asked them, can we open one of the edges, one of the corners? And they said it should be no problem. So we picked this corner to just basically cut off this metal piece, just open it up for pedestrians to easily just walk through and access the, um, the, the trails. You still won't be able to walk through it. At least bicyclists are able to use this as well now. And so it has now been opened and uh, much easier access to our trails from this location as well. One of the early on reasons was there's really no parking in this area. So you're parking in the residential area, very narrow residential. And uh, that's one reason why they don't want to invite a lot of people to start using this trail as a hike started their hike, but it seems to be a popular one. So this addressed the issues that we had at hand. Um, at the Miss American Green Cross Trail, which is just uh, at Bryant Park, north of the library, the Bryant Library, we had our little posts that were designed at the uh, the trailheads, those posts had fallen down. It took us a little while to get to it, but we finally did. We had it replaced, and this is what those posts look like again. Uh, they do deteriorate over time. Uh, we believe the first ones were maybe knocked down by, uh, you know, certain youth that decide to um, do vandalism at the parks. But it is back up, and we will keep an eye on it. When it does come down, we'll have the guys sort out and get new posts and be able to complete it. Another request by our bike riders at the Civic Auditorium at the south end of the parking lot. Uh, this is, the gate is open now, but this gate is a, a gate that is usually closed. So people don't have access to it. And the fact that the gates are closed, individuals that are biking through the uh, Civic, the back alley, they have a hard time ac exiting uh, the, the area. And that is because we have these curves on both sides. On both sides of the, uh, the driveway, these curves prevented people from being able to just easily maneuver through and out of it. So at the request of residents and the concerns, we just cut those out and allowed it to be open and much easier accessible on both sides. So people that are biking, we don't have to have the gate open. We could keep it closed for security purposes. They could just use those to exit and get back on Mountain Street. And this is the opposite side. Pacific Park, we had a grant from the county to do uh, physical fit fitness equipment at three of our parks. One of them is Pacific Park. Uh, one was Glendale Heritage, which we completed a couple of years back and we presented to commission. And one is at the ARC, Adult Recreation Center, and that is waiting for the Central Parks Master Planning process and the construction documents, so it kind of goes along with that construction. But for Pacific Park, we got approval from the county to move the equipment from indoors to outdoors. We found it to be better use outside as we've seen with other fitness equipment so we had them just kind of design it and lay it out this is north of the playground and i guess uh, the, the, the south of the community center south of the basketball courts and we had these installed it was a two-day project uh, after all the orders were in place and the sign is here it seems they brought the sign and installed it first day they were missing the sign we made some edits to the language and so it's up and running and uh, even the first day uh, according to staff we've had quite a few people using it now we do encourage the residents who want to use this to read the rules it's more for your safety it explains what you should and shouldn't do these are designed for youth 14 years and older. The playground is good for the children. So these are designed for the older youth. So 14 and older is what we recommend to be used again for their safety so they can prevent injuries. 
and um, that's the Pacific Park. So Bryant Park, Ben and Bench, we um, we you have been most of you have been at the the T ball park opening. When you were at the T ball opening, we said yeah the bench has arrived, but we don't have it installed yet. Um, and this is the project that actually shows the benches being installed and also the area for uh, the Little League, the T-Ball League, I should say. They needed an area for them to install their bin for their equipment, easy access right down the field. So our staff had to excavate the grass, get the area prepped, ready to go for the concrete pouring. Once the concrete was poured, we brought the bin and dropped it right where it's supposed to go. Now the uh, leagues actually have access to their equipment right in the shed very easy right off uh, the path of travel and uh, these were what we had prepped you probably had noticed this during the opening and we uh, on both sides obviously and the benches once they arrived they were assembled at the yard by our staff and brought and uh, placed and also concrete poured so now we have these long benches on both sides so when the teams are either practicing or the t-ballers are playing their games they'll have a safe place to to be able to practice uh, to be to be able to sit we're also extending the fence line on the first and third base because you know if Little League is able to practice on this field. It was part of the deal. They can actually come and practice. Little Leaguers can actually hit the ball a little better than the T-ballers. So for that, for the safety of the parents maybe sitting and waiting in the area, we'll be extending the first base and third base line, the fences by another 20 feet. That way people can park their lawn chairs on the, on the outside of it. And you know while the kids are practicing, they get their little rest. We are also contemplating on working on a possible uh, outfield fence to uh, help kind of determine where the boundary of the field is. We are in the midst of getting a purchase order uh, completed for that. And um, to be hopefully within the next month or so, we'll have that project completed as well. At Verdugo Community Garden, we've, we've shown commission parts and pieces of this project. This project was part of the master plan for uh, the Verdugo Park, and we piecemealed it and took this post p uh, this particular portion of the project and had our in-house in in staff do it. Now, we've shown you pictures of what it used to look like and what it became after the fact, and the only thing we're adding to this, it is a 15,000, or was a 15,000 square feet area which we dropped to about 7,500 thus allowing additional green space to go back into the park uh, and with that the original designs that we completed did not have bins for composting. Well, this is a community garden. There's going to be a lot of green leftovers. So our staff built these composting bins and had it installed in the side. So the people, the gardeners that are using uh, this, this facility for their gardening tools, they will be able to just simply start composting themselves and make best use of the, the greens that they get out. And for Duke Majan, you saw pictures of the opening. And uh, uh, I believe some of you were also there. The landscaping around the barn and the perimeter just within the parking lot or whatnot were completed by our staff. That was a, a quite the workload. It took several months to get this job completed. Not that they were there though in the entire time, but the different phases that it required. The biggest one was the irrigation. Um, we, we had to pretty much pull new irrigation lines to the backside of the barn and also the existing irrigation due to the construction they were cut and capped and we had to run all of the lines throughout the uh, uh, the back of the barn and north side of it and not only is it just the lines but also the wiring so we can actually have a controller controlling all of these by way of our centralized control system so uh, i don't have the number of the number of valves that were installed and the number of sprinklers but the entire area was re-landscaped the biggest challenge was as you can see once you just put a shovel down, you're digging up a lot of rock. This is Duke Majin. It is La Crescenta. And it is named for a purpose. And it became a challenge to be able to get through most of that. This is the backside of the barn. And there is just a concrete path here leading to nowhere. Uh, we contemplated different ideas of what to do with this location. Rather than creating layers with the concrete remaining, we decided to remove it. It served no purpose. So this entire back area was also irrigated. And you will notice pretty soon that it has also been landscaped. We landscaped and then we mulched it. Uh, this is, I believe, the last uh, irrigation main line, two inch line that went back to serve the backside. And over here, we, we got a lot of compliments from people who usually hike. This is the area just, I guess I would call it, west of the restroom and uh, across from the barn. This was heavily wooded. Uh, the original planting, it had way outgrown what it's supposed to. So we took it back and we did wanted to clean this up. You have a much better viewing from the bottom all the way up to the top of the trail in this. And it seemed that the hikers liked it so much. We're going to expand this to some of the other areas by removing the existing 
overgrown landscape and then replanting it, you know, sparsely planted so they'll take their time to grow and fill in. And of course, this is the layout for the, uh, the landscape behind the barn, just outside the patio area. And we want it to beautify it. In case somebody's using the patio for a little event, they'll have some nice landscaping to look at. And of course, digging and the planting after it's all laid out. This is the, uh, again, same east, west side of, east side of the barn. And this is just a side going down to the path for the, uh, the patio. And with the irrigation functioning, the plants are doing well. We, we brought in about 100 cubic yards of mulch for this site to be able to just cover all the areas. And uh, it helps, obviously, retain the moisture. It also helps make it look you know, nicer and keep the weeds down. This was, the, it took a couple of days just to get the mulch all over. And you might have smelled a little bit of mulch, but this is actually compost mulch. mulch. So it had, it was very rich. It was very rich in nutrients. And by the time the opening was there, the, the smell was, had dissipated. So that was a good thing. Um, again, this is the north side of the barn, mulch being applied throughout. And this is one shot of the, uh, the, the old restroom where the mulch, we expanded to some of the parking areas as well. Also down at the south end where the, um, the amphitheater is, we had to uh, redo the turf, the sod for the opening especially, as it had, you know, it had been damaged. And this is the job completed. And when you were there, it should have looked just as clean after it was done. And that is the uh, extent of my report for today. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to address them. Thanks for uh, opening up that uh, trail uh, gate, because I I hiked that often. Glad. <laughs> and glad. now I don't have to duck under. I appreciate that. So you're one of them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you you never called us on it. I, no. <laughs> I wish I wish you had. But uh, no, I, I'm, that was that was a very uh, uh, successful thing, I believe. Just based on feedback from the community and working with fire and having them be okay with it being open for pedestrian access, I think it did exactly what it was meant to do. Any comments? Yes, I did have uh, questions or comments. Um, for uh, a few of the items that you shared, um, thank you for the report. I would like to really encourage um, you and the department to uh, try to think about how public art and art can be incorporated mm -hmm. into our facilities a little bit more. For example, the bench. Um, I get, you know, it looks great that it's a standard bench. It looks like a for a baseball field. It's clean. It's uh, probably uh, pretty affordable for, uh, um, for its use. Uh, but we do have a huge fund, right, that is specifically for public art. And if it can be used... Um, at our parks, I think we should take advantage of it. Um, I did have a question about the Stone Center uh, landscaping. Uh, you, I understand the need to take out uh, the brush. Sometimes it, they dry out and they become fire hazards for sure. Um, are the plants that were re replanted back into uh, the area local flora and fauna for um, Southern California, I'm assuming, yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, President Southern Bay, again, Commissioners, uh, uh, Commissioner Alcazar, that is correct. We've, okay. we've chosen uh, the variety of species that are na naturally within the region, and that's what we've planted the area back. Okay. And to address the first question, we, we yes. generally do incorporate art in some of our projects, uh, and we, we will we'll work closely with the Library Arts and Culture uh, Department in, in expanding that to other opportunities, when opportunities do present themselves to incorporate it as well. I mean, Fremont's gonna have a, a <coughs> couple of you know art pieces in there. We work closely with them on the, the Adams Mini, the gas station, because that, be, that has become more of you know, the cultural and art, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, historic site. And you know any opportunities that present themselves for art in the park, we will work with our LAC department to uh, to get it get it accomplished. Yeah, and uh, maybe when we get to this master plan uh, of our parks assessment, uh, we can try to plan ahead of our next projects that are coming up and really think about how to um, incorporate arts moving forward. But thank you. Sounds great. Thank you. I think that's it. I'd like. One other comment. Uh, I, I know I visited the uh, public works down at the Arborist, and they uh, have worked with the West Coast Arborists mm -hmm. numerous times. Uh, when you go to do Fremont Park, uh, there'll be a lot of cutting down of mature trees that possibly they could, West Coast Arborists could be part of 
taking those and turning them into furniture that we could put into the community buildings. Uh, I just want to keep that in mind, you know, if the possibility is there. Yes, uh, President Sarabagi and members of the commission. Commissioner Meek, that is something we'll evaluate. Some of the trees we're removing, a big majority of the trees, the numbers are the palm trees, the tall, skinny palms, and I'm not sure there's much they can do with those. But if there are any specific mature trees that can be used to be recycled, it is something we will consider. Even in-house, one of our Park Service managers, he, he thrives on reusing um, whatever we you know, excavate from our facilities. So that is something we'll definitely consider for items that can be used for such purposes. Uh, we'll get forestry involved in the process and see which ones they would want to preserve and, uh, and make use of it. So we'll, we'll include that in the process. Thank you. Sure. Next item. Um, just for the record, President um, Sardar Beckin, I just wanted to note that uh, Commissioner Kofayan left at 4.04 p.m. Um, next is adjournment. Hey, I'd like to, uh, I guess, welcome our entire uh, community to make sure, make sure uh, now that, you know, the weather is a lot better, we get beautiful sun throughout the day. I really, really hope that uh, our community takes advantage of all the wonderful parks and nature centers that we have now. Uh, obviously, our staff is putting in a lot of effort, time and uh, uh, funds into beautifying and making it more and more usable. Um, so I really hope that uh, we get out there and we enjoy, you know, all the free spaces. I think uh, you guys are are doing an excellent job, and uh, I have faith that you guys are going to continue this uh, the amazing job you guys are doing. And I hope the community takes advantage of it. We are uh, extremely uh, fortunate to have so many parks within the city. So I hope to see a lot of our community uh, members out there uh, enjoying the space. Other than that, I think uh, we are finished for today's uh, meeting. Thank you. Return.